I made apple pie, whatever this is with the rest of my dough. It wasn't very nice because the dough is super thick, so look. Ow! What the fuck? Alright, hi guys, Dane here and welcome to another weekly reading slash writing vlog. It is currently Tuesday. There was an open mic on theoretically this evening, but I didn't want to go and I'm glad I didn't because um, it got cancelled. So my mate Dave went all the way there with his keyboard and had to walk all the way back. But that's not what you're here for. You want to hear about books. So um, I've been reading Blueprint for Revolution by uh, Sroja Popovich and Matthew Miller. Let me mute WhatsApp very quickly. And uh, this is a real life buddy read and uh, yeah, I'm currently about 200 odd pages in of about 260. It's basically about how all these different revolutions have worked and how to kind of use humour to topple a regime. So the subtitle is how to use rice pudding, Lego men and other non-violent techniques to galvanise communities, overthrow dictators or simply change the world. So for example, the Lego men reference is when um, basically uh, protests were banned, like large groups of people were banned, but there was no law in place against toys. So people made Made these huge protests of like thousands of Lego toys all holding little signs which I thought was a cool idea so yeah it's all right it's not the best written and it honestly it feels a bit disjointed almost as though it's been written as a series of mini essays or, or something rather than as an overall uh, non-fiction book but it's decent enough so far and um, last night in bed I finished reading this, which is Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. This is like a cute little illustrated edition as well. Let me see if I can find the really good one if someone gets shot in the face. Yeah, here it is. He's getting shot in the face. Um, so I, I, I picked this up and I read the first chapter or so and I was kind of bored of it, but I wanted to finish it because I wanted it to be one of those, you know, the classics that I've read. So I decided to read it as my bedtime book and I was doing like 25 pages at a time and I started to get really really into it to the point at which in the end I was like looking forward to going to bed so I could read some more of it and uh, yeah I basically think the first couple of chapters were kind of slow the last couple were just bad in general and then it had like Stephen King syndrome where it just randomly ended as though he'd ran out of things to write about but the actual bulk of the novel set on the island was great I'd also forgotten that Man Friday was a character and then even when he was a character I totally didn't expect his dad to show up as well and then by the end of this novel like there's like loads of people on the island and I don't know you always just think of Robinson Crusoe as by himself but um it was really interesting and actually I don't know if Todd the librarian's read it but he totally should because there's lots of like sort of survivalist stuff in there as well and uh, overall just generally a classic that I'd recommend I gave it a four out of five so that's me pretty much up to date with stuff for now. I've been doing a little bit of filming and editing and I'm going to do a little bit more. And uh, yeah, I'm also going to do some reading. I want to try and finish reading this tonight if I can and then I'm going to move back on to some of the Penguin Mini Moderns. Uh, all in all, yeah, yeah, doing pretty good. And uh, work's going okay, I've got some stuff in. Got a driving lesson tomorrow as well. And on Thursday I'm going to see a play. So uh, I'll keep you posted with that, all right. These are mushroom puff pies. Mmm. Biggie. You investigating the carrier bag? It's just got some beers in, hasn't it, mate? Yeah, it's not for you. That's for you. Your food's over there, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Mmm. Yes, indeed. Oh, -ho! stretchy, stretchy, stretchy. Is that nice, was it? Alright, so it is uh, Wednesday. I have a few books to update you on. Tomorrow I am going to Oxford, so I'll be going to see a play in the evening. Uh, and f I have momentarily forgotten what the play is called. There's Biggie. Alright, cat. Uh, Him for Robots, I think that's what it's called. Um, so yeah, that's that'd be cool. That's going to be in Oxford at the old fire station. Um, I have some books to update you on, like I said. So I finished reading Blueprint for the Revolution by Sergei Popovich and Matthew Miller. So this was okay. It was The writing was occasionally clunky here and there and also occasionally repetitive. And there were a few mistakes like where, you know, there was one bit where the uh, authors said, oh, I don't know whether you've heard of so-and-so. And they'd introduced, they talked about this person 20 pages earlier. So of course you've heard about him. So it kind of came across much more as though it had been written you know, 
uh, in the form of different essays that had all been cobbled together into one book or something. Having said that, it was still interesting if you're interested in like peaceful protests and uh, you know organizing movements and that kind of stuff. It's a pretty good one to read, and also it's quite cool how it just talks about how humour can be used uh, to create a revolution. He's off. So yeah, 3.75 out of 5 for that. Then I read Johann Peter Habel, How a Ghastly Story Was Brought to Light by a Commonal Garden Butcher's Dogs. This is Penguin Mini Modern Classic number, sorry, Mini Classic, Mini Black Classic number 22, the blurb. Sparkling miniature German fables, sketches and tall tales, including Kafka's favourite story. And this very much reminded me of things like uh, The Brothers Grimm, uh, Hans Christian Andersen, who actually is in the, one of the later books that I've just started reading. So it got this very much kind of this feel of them being fables, but they were also entertaining as well. Delightful to read, well written, well translated, and that was a 4 out of 5 for me. Then I read Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Well, They Are Gone and Here Must I Remain, Penguin Mini Modern number 35, sorry, Mini Classic. I keep doing that because I read the Mini Moderns first. Dreamlike, poignant verse on passion, torment, and resplendent landscapes from one of the first romantic poets. So I'm going to read you, that one looked like a short one. Lady, to death we're doomed. Lady, to death we're doomed, our crime the same. Thou, that in me thou kindledst such fierce heat. I, that my heart did of a sun so sweet. The rays concentrate to so hot a flame. I, fascinated by an adder's eye. Deaf as an adder, thou to all my pain. Thou obstinate in scorn, in passion I. I loved too much, too much didst thou disdain. Here then our doom in hell as just as stern, our sentence equal as our crimes conspire, who living basked at beauty's earthly fire, in living flames eternal these must burn, hell for us both fit places to supplies, in my heart thou wilt burn, I roast before thine eyes. I'm sure it's very good if you like that kind of stuff, but it's not really my kind of poetry. I have read some Coleridge in the past. I actually visited Coleridge Cottage. So I think I read, I read like The Rime of the Ancient Mariner and a few other bits and bobs, and I did enjoy those. This collection, not so much. It's just not really for me. I still gave it a 3 out of 5 because it's not bad. It's just not my kind of thing, you know? And that brings us on to my current read, which is Hans Christian Andersen, The Tinderbox. Penguin, Little Black Classic, number 23. Got it right that time. Anderson's bittersweet fairy tales propelled their troubled author to international fame and revolutionised children's writing. And obviously, you've probably heard of Hans Christian Anderson, but if not, him and the Brothers Grimm are basically like the most well known for writing fairy tales and, uh, you know, almost like modern day proverbs, I guess. Not modern day, but modern at the time they were written. So yeah, I'm enjoying it and I'm going to crack on with some more of those mini black classics. I might take Agatha Christie, I think I've got a, I can't remember which one, it doesn't actually say on the spine of it. But I might take an Agatha Christie one with me to Oxford as well, so we will see. But uh, yeah, I think that's all up to date. Cool. Uh, I do need to do some more filming and editing soon as well, but I will get there. I will get there. Yeah. Um, I made cookies. And I'm watching Devin Supertramp. Welcome to the old hose tower. So they used to have the ladder and the boy would run up, take the hose pipes with him and then hang them over to hang down and dry. Ah. Alright, 
I am back in High Wycombe at my house. Uh, this is the poster for the play I went to see. So it's about the woman who um, basically she wrote the uh, the theme to Doctor Who and various other bits and bobs. It was kind of about her life story. I thought it was really good, but the people I were with weren't quite as impressed with it. But I really enjoyed it. Oh, I'm hungover though because. Um... Well, we went to the pub um, with, uh, so I, I went to the play with uh, Bex, who is uh, the my lady friend, and um, yeah, I met like a bunch of her friends and stuff, and then we all went to the pub afterwards, which was good fun, except then I got a bit sad, and then because I was sad, I drank some gin and tonic, I drank two things of gin and tonic, well, like she'd fallen asleep in bed and I was like lying next to her just drinking gin and tonic and reading this, which I might as well talk about now, which is my latest book, current read. Uh, Rebellious Spirits, Audacious Tales of Drinking on the Wrong Side of the Law by Ruth Ball. So this was actually sent to me for review a while back and I read the first five, ten pages and wasn't thinking too much of it. So I put it down to be my bedtime book and then again I started reading it in bed last night and as you can see... Uh, you know, I'm pretty far far through because it turns out to be really good. So I am enjoying this. Um, yes, very good so far. Some other updates. My previous bedtime book before that one was uh, Douglas Adams and John Lloyd, The Deeper Meaning of Lif, a dictionary of things that there aren't any words for yet. And what's cool about this as well is that all of the terms in it are uh, place names. Uh, so, let's, for example, Kurdistan, a noun. Hard stare given by a husband to his wife when he notices a sharp increase in the number of times he answers the phone to be told, sorry, wrong number. Let's do another one. Thrumster, noun. The irritating man next to you in a concert who thinks he's the conductor. Let's do one more. Delaware, noun. The hideous stuff on the shelves of a rented house. Okay. Well, I just got a little bit of breeze, breeze of air and I think it was from this, actually. I don't know, where the hell is that air coming from? Like a little cold breeze. Uh, anyway, yeah, this was like 3.5 out of 5. It was all right. Um, I mean, I had to read it for, in bed, for bed, really, because it is look, literally just a long list of definitions. So um, it got a little dull from time to time. But um, I'm glad that I've read it. And, uh, yeah, there's also just one just called The Meaning of Lift. But I think this is just an expanded version of that, I think. I'm not sure. I'm going to try and get it at some point anyway. And then... I also read a couple of uh, the Penguin Mini Modern, uh, sorry, Mini Black Classics. So this is Charles Dickens' The Great Winglebury Jewel, number 37. Two rollicking tales of scoundrels and ne'er-do-wells from the sketches by Boz that launched Dickens' career. So that was when Dickens used to write these... Oh, hello, I dropped it on the floor, never mind. That's when Dickens used to write these stories for, like, the uh, newspaper. And it's kind of what built his fame. And they were hilarious, really funny. I actually gave that one a 5 out of 5 because I enjoyed it so much more than I was expecting to. And it's put me on a, a bit of a Dickens hype again, really. Because um, I I, I've read a bit of Dickens here and there. And I used to love Oliver Twist and reread it a bunch of times. Uh, but I haven't read anything new by him for a while. So that was really interesting. And I would like to read more of his uh, sketches by Boz. Okay. And then finally, I also read The Wife of Bath by Geoffrey Chaucer, number 28. One of the most famous Canterbury tales casts a satirical eye over sex and marriage in the medieval age. And what was cool about this, so obviously this is from the Canterbury Tales, and I've been to Canterbury, I've been to the Canterbury Tales attraction as well. It's actually my first time reading Chaucer though. But it's quite a modern translation. I'm just going to go in at random and read you a few lines. Dear mother, said the knight, alack the day, I am as good as dead if I can't say what thing it is that women most desire. If you could tell me, I would pay your hire. Give me your hand, she said, and swear to do whatever I shall next require of you. Um, yeah, translated by Neville Coghill. So I guess it was originally written in Old English, and this is like a translation into, you know, contemporary English or whatever. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it, actually. I thought it was pretty good and quite uh, risque as well for a, a book of its time, which is uh, very cool. So that is me up to date, really. Um, this evening I'm going to try and finish off reading this. Uh, and then I will, I, I guess this in bed I'll get to start a new bedtime book, so which is exciting. And uh, yeah, I've got some more Penguin Mini Monster to read. I want to do some Christie soon. Just keep them busy. Oh, and I recorded a song earlier as well. Maybe I will, uh, I will link below if I remember so you can listen to it if you want. It's called, uh, I don't know, I've forgotten what it's called already. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. It was fun. The bass in it was good. Let me show. Let me give you a little uh, a little preview of it. It's called jar. It's called jar of hearts. And my phone just pinged.
I like the little bass where it goes bow, bow, bow. Here we go, let's go to the speaker. There we go. Oh, and then actually, we'll just play a bit more of this. I'll just talk over it. Uh, like I said, I'll link if you want to check it out. I like the bit as it goes into the chorus as well because it gets distorted. There we go, all right. I made cinnamon whirls. They taste really good, especially with vegan ice cream. Very nice. And now I'm watching Reckless Eating and they're about to blend 60 different lip balm flavors and then taste them. Very nice. Uh, in terms of reading, I don't have too much to update you with. I was reading, uh, it was the Henry James edition of the mini modern classics and Basically, I got so bored with it, I'm, I'm switching it out as my bedtime book. I'm also reading the first Witcher book as my bedtime book, and I got, I'm up to about 50 pages in now, and I'm really bored, which doesn't bode well. But I'm going to plough through it, because I have heard good stuff about the series, so I'm going to keep going, and uh, hopefully I start to enjoy it more, I guess. Uh, so in the meantime, I've been reading Lord Arthur Savile's Crime by Oscar Wilde, number 59 of the Penguin Black Classics. Wild, supremely witty tale of dandies, anarchists, and a murderous prophecy in London high society. And yeah, it's been very good so far, as you would expect from Wild. Um, I'm not going to say too much about it, because it's very easy to sort of spoil this one, I think, as well. So um, I know a lot, a lot of people really hate it when people, other people say you should just go in blind. But I do genuinely think that's what you should do with this book. Um, so yeah. All right. <laughs> I made some uh, vegan pasta with like it's noble mince meat. That's the that's the stuff. And I'm watching Fail Army. Hooray! All right, I'm gonna do a quick update on some books I've been reading, mainly because there are a lot of them. I've cocked this up quite a bit actually. So we'll go back to um, bas basically for a day or two. I think I thought I'd wrapped some books up and I hadn't. So we've got like three days worth of reading here, but uh, yeah, I finished reading uh, Rebellious Spirits by Ruth Ball. I'm going to go and turn my light off because it's casting some strange shadows. So I finished reading Rebellious Spirits by Ruth Ball. I gave that a four out of five and would definitely recommend it if non-fiction is your kind of thing, especially if you like non-fiction um, about alcohol, basically, and prohibition, especially it's, it's not really touching on America, although there are some references to it. But um, yeah, taxation and, and prohibition in the UK, specifically on things like rum and other spirits really enjoyed it would definitely recommend and then I've been reading some of these uh, penguin little black classics so here we have Hans Christian Andersen number 23 the tinderbox Andersen's bittersweet fairy tales propelled their troubled author to international fame and revolutionized children's writing now obviously Hans Christian Andersen is super well known the tinderbox is actually one of his most well known ones as well there was the princess in the pea in here what else do we have? Uh, Little Claws and Big Claws, or Klaus, I don't know. The Steadfast Tin Soldier, I remember that one as well from when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, I, I read some of Anderson's stories, but only in other kind of collections and stuff. So it was nice to go specifically into a collection of just his work. Yeah, probably a four out of five for me. We have Oscar Wilde, Lord Arthur Savile's Crime, at number 59 here. Wild, supremely witty tale of dandies, anarchists, and a murderous prophecy in London high society. And it was witty, it was also a lot darker than I was expecting, and I really liked that actually. I thought that worked really well. And um, it turns out this is actually on my wish list, because you can just get this, you know, printed not as a little black classic or whatever, but as a standalone Oscar Wilde kind of novella. So, yeah, I'm pretty glad that I got to this. It was a four out of five for me, and it reminded me, again, it's, it's definitely wild. You can tell while reading it, but um, also it reminded me of something like Henry James or something like that as well, but 
a bit better because as we will get on to here, we have Henry James, the figure in the carpet, number 49. James's troubling late Victorian mystery of an unsolved literary riddle and sudden death has inspired endless speculation. So I really liked the turn of the screw when I read that, but this not so much. I kind of started drifting out about halfway through it. And by the end, I actually switched out as a bedtime book and just read the last 20 pages in bed just just to get through them so I didn't really enjoy it I'd have to give it a two out of five I do I can see why other people would enjoy it though it's just personally it didn't it didn't tick my boxes you know it didn't engage with me as a story and because of that the actual good bits of it uh, you know there were bits of the writing that were beautiful for example and the plot itself was pretty good it's just I, I just didn't really like the execution of it and, um, and and I just couldn't get past that I guess so okay then we have Matsuo Basho, Manila, sorry. Then we have Matsuo Basho, Lips Too Chilled, number 62. Japan's celebrated Buddhist poet balances the smallness of humanity with nature's epic drama in these magical 17th century haikus. Uh, actually, I was taught at uni that the plural of haiku is haiku, so I'm going to stick with that. And we also studied Basho, and I've read The Narrow Road to the Deep North, which was really, really good, actually. And the only like problem I have with this is look they could have got so many more haiku in this collection however what what is in here is beautiful so I'm going to read you a couple pages worth sparrow bleh. sparrows in rape field blossom viewing cold white azalea lone nun under thatched roof draining the sake cask behold a gallon flower vase on my knees hugging roots I grieve for priest tando so there we go. I gave that a 5 out of 5. I just love Basho stuff. Obviously, that's not necessarily in the 575 format that you normally would associate haiku with, I guess. But that's because, obviously, it's been translated. And um, it, the actual rules of haiku are a lot more complicated than just 5 syllables, 7 syllables, 5 syllables. So I think we can let Basho just have what he wants, really. I mean, he basically was the master of the form. Okay, then we have Henry Mayhew of Street Pie Men, number 26. The matchless chronicler of Victorian Londoners observes everything from surprise pie fillings to a balloon ride over the city. And this is basically non-fiction Dickens is how I describe it. It does a really great job of capturing what London is and what it was like as well. Capturing some of the people as well, capturing the atmosphere, the sights, the sounds, the smells of the city. It really feels as though you're there. It's almost like time travelling, you know? And so I gave that one a 4 out of 5 as well. I thought it was really well written and just really fascinating. If you're interested at all in London, I would definitely recommend that. Especially Victorian London. Then we have Hafez, The Nightingales Are Drunk, number 27. Spiritual, sensual verses on love, heartbreak and celebrating life's small pleasures by the great 14th century Persian poet. Now actually... Sometimes I find more old school poetry, I guess anything before the 20th century really, I quite often have a hard time just enjoying it. Like I can appreciate it, but I don't necessarily enjoy it, you know. But this one I could appreciate and enjoy as well, so I'll read you a, a, few, a, few, a few lines here. What memories I once lived on, the street that you lived on, and to my eyes how bright the dust before your doorway shone. We were a lily and a rose, our talk was then so pure. That what was hidden in your heart and what I said were one. And when our hearts discoursed with wisdom's ancient words, love's commentary solved each crutch within our lexicon. I told my heart that I would never be without my friend, but then our efforts fail and hearts are weak what can be done. There's more to it than that, but um, I'm going to leave it at that. But yeah, that was a solid four out of five. For okay, well, apologies for the terrible quality and lighting. Uh, I've lost my charger for my camera, so I'm filming this last little bit on my phone. But I just wanted to finish this bit up as a temporary stopgap because this is right at the end of the video. So I read Words as Weapons, and this was edited by Rowan Padmore. It's also got AJ, Doug Lucy, Lucy Jacobs, Mary Bell, Peter Cox MBE, and Tom Kuhn in it. And um, basically, this is a collection of poetry all by poets who met at a writing group for uh, In Support of Crisis, which is, I believe it's a homeless uh, charity. And uh, this was given to me by uh, by my new girlfriend. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blush. <laughs> um, because she works at the uh, the art centre in uh, Oxford, where this was like put on as a performance, and where the um, you know the writers all met and whatnot, and actually they share the building with Crisis as well, and it was very good. I gave it a four out of five. Um, some of the poets are better than others, but you always get that with one of those collections, you know. 
I also read uh, Tulipomania by um, Wilfred Blunt. And this is a King Penguin book. It's super old, as you can see. It's actually a first edition that I've got. Um, and these are quite rare and quite expensive. They have these beautiful illustrations inside. And yeah, it, it was just lovely. And basically, it just talks about the history of tulips, including there was a time in uh, Amsterdam where basically tulips were being used as like a form of gambling. People were basically buying and selling them uh, based on, you know, the, uh, the the typical price of them or whatever. And suddenly there was a big crash and everyone just lost their money and it all went a bit nuts. Uh, so yeah. And then the final things I want to talk to you about are Il Juro by D.H. Lawrence, which is mini black classic number 71. Sketches of scorched landscapes, peasants and wild spirits from Lawrence's travels in early 20th century Italy. And H.G. Wells, A Slip Under the Microscope, number 77. Disturbing prescient stories of human conscience and conflicting desires by the pioneer of science fiction. All three of those last books were all four out of five books, all very enjoyable. Uh, Wells and uh, Lawrence in particular are both very good writers, but also the plotting in them was good. The, I actually also enjoyed just the time setting they were in as well, so uh, that, was, that was rather nice. And that pretty much brings me up to date. I am now reading a much more contemporary novel, which is The Blue Flock, the, the, the Blue Fox by Sean, who is an Icelandic author who actually collaborates with Bjork sometimes. So I'm looking forward to reading that. But anyway, I've waffled on for long enough and I'm very conscious of the poor quality of my iPhone. So on that note, I'm gonna love you and leave you. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye-bye.